Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? Now, a few weeks back, I was talking about the Voyager space probe, about how NASA had lost contact with Voyager 1 because of a problem with the onboard computer system, and then how the engineers at NASA had managed to restore communications with it. Now, I want you to imagine for one second that you're working on that team. Voyager is 24 billion kilometers away. You can't exactly bring it back into the shop to see what's wrong. All you can do is to analyze the data you have, formulate a hypothesis, come up with a fix, and then transmit that fix and wait to see if it worked. And that waiting, we're talking about over 22 hours each way. So if you send a command on Monday afternoon, on Tuesday, all you can do is wait, and then if you're lucky, sometime on Wednesday morning, you'll find out whether your fix worked or not. And if you don't get a reply, send the command again. Maybe you'll get a response sometime on Friday. That's 45 hours between deploying the fix and finding out if it worked. Now, in NASA's case, there is literally nothing they can do to improve that. The speed of light is a hard limit. But for the rest of us, one of the most powerful things that we can do to improve the quality of our software is to look for ways to tighten that feedback loop. And I've been thinking about that a lot this week because I've been working on a couple of things that have given me some, uh, some quite interesting <laughs> feedback loops. One of the projects I'm working on at the moment is uh, I'm integrating with a, a payment system API. So, you know, automatically synchronizing orders and payments from our system into another app so that the client's accountants get all the details of every order. And uh, the API they're using is based on OAuth 2. Now, if you're not familiar with OAuth 2, it has a quite neat approach to authentication. To connect to an OAuth 2 based system, you use your username and password, what they call a client ID and a client secret, to get a pair of tokens. And one token is called an access token. This is the one you include with every API request that proves that you are who you say you are. And access tokens are designed to be short lived. The one that I'm working with here expires after four hours, but you'll often see OAuth systems giving out access tokens that are only good for 10 or 15 minutes. Now, when you get your access token, you also get a thing called a refresh token. And the idea of the refresh token is that when your access token expires, you can use the refresh token to get another one. Problem is, whoever built this API, I think they might have messed it up, because uh, when my access tokens expire, my refresh token expires as well. At least I, I think that's what's happening. What I know for sure, after about a week of really very diligent troubleshooting, is that when I push out a new release of this thing, everything works beautifully for four hours, it's your first clue, and then the API requests start to fail, and refreshing the token, that fails, it says unauthorized client, I get an error message from it. Now, you know, this is not actually a big deal. It is trivially easy to work around, but the fact that the only way to troubleshoot the problem is to deploy the code, run it, get a token, wait four hours, and then try again, that has made it particularly frustrating to try to figure out exactly what's going on here. Now, alongside that, I've been spending a bunch of time porting my Rockstar interpreter to .NET. Uh, Rockstar is an esoteric programming language based on heavy metal song lyrics. You can check it out at codewithrockstar.com if that sounds like your idea of fun. And it has some really bizarre language syntax. Now, Rockstar has a test suite. There is a set of about a hundred programs that exercise all of the quirks of the language. And so the first thing that I did was I created an X unit wrapper around the test suite so that I can run my work in progress interpreter against that entire set of tests and see how many of them are still failing. Now, I'm a big fan of Joe Armstrong. Uh, Joe is the creator of the Erlang programming language, and I uh, had this lovely quote about building high quality software. Make it work, then make it beautiful, then if you really have to, make it fast. 90% of the time, if you make it beautiful, it will already be fast, so really, just make it beautiful. Now, the problem is, when I, uh, I decided that my, my first uh, Rockstar.net milestone would be to just get every test case passing. And in hindsight, this was a mistake. Because although it works, it is not fast and it is not beautiful. It is a big, 
ugly pile of slow code that has been ported straight across from JavaScript. And now I'm finding that a lot of those tests are taking 10 or 15 seconds to run, which, yeah, is it's better than four hours. <laughs> it's a lot better than 44 hours. But it's amazing how long 15 seconds feels when you're staring at a test and wondering whether it's going to pass or it's going to time out because you've accidentally wired up an infinite loop somewhere. The value of an automated test to me is largely dictated by how often that test gets run. Like many of you folks out there, I've worked on projects that had a test suite that only worked if everything was set up just right beforehand. You had to set up the right database records and transaction IDs and make sure DNS was configured. And yes, it was still quicker and more thorough than testing everything by hand. But the sheer amount of work involved in running the test suite meant it only got run as part of a release cycle, you know, maybe once a week if you were lucky. The best tests of all are the ones that are so cheap and easy to run that you might as well just run them all the time, round and round and round and round. You know, imagine if you could run your entire test suite every time you typed a line of code. Uh, if something you just did has broken your application, you'll know about it before you've even saved the file. You can catch breaking changes straight away, not in 10 minutes when you run the tests, or tomorrow morning when your CI build fails, or next week when one of the testers picks it up, or six months from now when one of your customers reports that their data has gone missing, or worse, you know, it's ended up for, for sale on the dark web or something. Well, it turns out you can. I want to tell you about two tools that have become a, an indispensable part of the way that I write software. Now, just to be clear, these are commercial tools. They cost money. I'm not getting any kind of consideration for featuring them in this video. They're just really good tools I've happily paid for, and I'm telling you about them because I think they're really good, and maybe you want to check them out and uh, go and buy copies for yourselves. Uh, the first one is called NCrunch. Now, I've been using NCrunch since version 1, which was nearly 12 years ago. Uh, it's a plugin for Microsoft Visual Studio, the most recent release, which is version 5, that also runs on JetBrains Rider, and it keeps track of every test in your code base and which lines of code are covered by those tests. Here's a little demo project I put together. This is a simple, it's an ASP.NET MVC web application. It's got a couple of methods and some authorization filters. This is running in Visual Studio 2022 with NCrunch enabled. Now, you see the little green dots in the left margin? Those green dots, each dot means there is at least one test covering this line, and right now that test is passing. So I don't need to keep a separate window open with my test results. Now uh, let's create a new action for, uh, let's say we're doing a user settings page. So I'm going to copy and paste the account action, I'm going to rename it, and before I even save the file, NCrunch is telling me something's wrong. Well, what's wrong? Okay, I can click on the red dot, and yeah, look at that, I messed up. There is a test here that verifies that anonymous users can't see the account page, and that test is now failing because I copied the method, but I didn't copy the authorize attribute, and I renamed the wrong one. Now, if you see a white dot, that's saying, hey, there is code here that has no tests, and so the next thing to do is to add a test around that method. And if you see a yellow dot, that's telling you that this line of code is running slower than the ones around it. I'm using the ASP.NET Web Application Factory in these tests, and if I look at my test code here, I can see that this line, factory.createClient, that's taken 117 milliseconds on average. So if I do need to start optimizing my tests so they'll run faster, the yellow dots tell me where to start. NCrunch also has a test explorer window, like the ones that ship with Visual Studio and ReSharper, but really for me it is all about those little green dots. Now, there's another tool that I started using much more recently, which is called Wallaby. It does basically the same thing, but for JavaScript and TypeScript. It supports just about every test runner in the JavaScript ecosystem, works with VS Code, Visual Studio, Sublime, most of the JetBrains IDEs. Now, I've been using Wallaby on and off for a couple of months now. It has loads of features that I have not really used yet, but it still absolutely hits that sweet spot for me. Green dots next to lines of code, continuous rapid test feedback. Uh, this code is from a, it's a string extension library from a, one of my open source projects. Um, there's a method here that'll return the last word in a string. And look at that, if I change the regex that it's splitting on, the test indicator goes red straight away. And if I navigate around the code, I get all this lovely, you know, rich information about what went wrong, what was expected, and what actually happened. 
dealing with these kinds of things, it always reminds me of this uh, old joke about software development, which says, really, you know, all developers are doing the same thing. We write some code, we run it, we find out if it worked, and we repeat. And if you do this every five minutes, that's extreme programming. And if you do it every day, that's agile. And if you do it every two weeks, you're doing Scrum. Every three months, that's enterprise. And if you do it every five years, you work for Oracle. And, uh, you know, I think there's actually a lot of truth in that. I'm pretty sure the part about Oracle isn't true, but a significant part of the conversation around improving the craft of software engineering over the last 25 years has been about how to get faster feedback. The faster we can find out if something works, the less time we'll spend working on something that we might have to throw away because it doesn't work, or worse than that, shipping things that we know are broken because there is no time or budget left to go back and do them properly. Now, folks, if you have an awesome testing tool or a pattern that you want to share, drop a link in the comments. You know, I'm always interested in learning more about how other people approach these kinds of things. But right now, for me, it's feedback loop time. First, there's going to be the, the YouTube pre-flight check that scans the video for copyright violations. Then in a couple of hours, I'll see the first few comments. Let me know the video has gone live. People are watching it. And sometime next week, I'll get analytics that show me how many people watched it and how many of you got bored and how many subscribed. And then it'll be time to go back and repeat. Do it all over again. Folks, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, you'll have a good week out there. You look after each other. And I'll catch you next time.